good. Oh, I, do I say got it then? Yes, I continue. Okay, right. Let me see of some other differences. Well, the big difference is, is when you talk about materials and you say, please bring your pencils and rubbers. <laughs> <laughs> and you think, uh oh, this, is a, this class is not turning out to be what I expected it to be. Well, of course, rubbers in, in British English, it means in American English, means eraser. So it's, it's, so, it's so different. Or things like, um, if a black cat crosses your path, it's a sign of good luck in oh. England. And it's a sign of bad luck in America. Mm -hmm. And I find that really surprising that you have that kind of differences in, in you know, something that's similar. Or like when you set the table, you have the fork on one side if you're British, and you have the fork on the other side if you're American. <laughs> and they don't like the table being set incorrectly. They're really particular about <laughs> that. And the size of their cutlery is enormous. And I, I don't understand this because you think of the British as being kind of delicate and quite mannerly uh, in the way that they eat, but they open their mouths and they just shovel it in. <laughs> I don't say that to my British friends. I don't think they would like that. But it's, it's really quite amazing uh, because their serving spoons are like their tablespoons, which you eat with. And I find that I don't like a big cutlery. Uh, it's too heavy. It's too, too wide, too big. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, how does this meeting work? It's the AGM. So it's, does somebody conduct the AGM meeting? Yeah, so Jennifer, should we start our meeting, do you think? Yes, I think it's a good time to start. OK, so why don't we do that? All right. So um, my name is Kava Gerber. I'm the program um, chair for a Society for Calligraphy. And I organized this AGM, but I couldn't have done it without a lot of help. Um, here, I want to first uh, thank uh, behind the scene people, such as our facilitator, Christy Darwick, who is in charge of our Zoom meetings and always has a, a helpful hand in that. Also, um, our facilitator is Angie Vangelis. And um, I'm only here going to do a, a short little introduction. Jennifer is going to be taking over and talking about the business end of our meeting. But uh, before we do that, um, a lot of you might not know that uh, this is Jennifer's final meeting for us. She's finishing her uh, tenure as our president of Society for Calligraphy. She's done an amazing job under really hard circumstances. So the board has already given her a gift, which um, is still not enough to thank her for all the hard work that she's done for us um, as a society. We've also uh, commissioned Jane Shibata to create a beautiful certificate for her. Unfortunately, because of uh, School commitments and things, it's not quite finished yet, um, but I did want to read what the inscription has, is going to say, and it will be presented to Jennifer um, as soon as it's finished. And what the certificate does say is in recognition of her work in coordinating the Society for Calligraphy's unusually challenging year, as we experience a worldwide pandemic, the Board of Governors of Society for Calligraphy present this certificate of appreciation to Jennifer Padilla for her leadership as president from July 2019 to June 2021, and will be presented on June 6, 2021 to the Society for Calligraphy. So I'm sure everyone will join me in thanking Jennifer for all her hard work. And uh, we hope to see her in future events as one of our members. And hopefully, you know, you never know, she might volunteer for something again in the future. Um, I wanna switch it over now to Jennifer and she will conduct our business. Thanks very much for attending. Thank you, Hava, and, and thank you so much for those kind words on, on the certificate and the gift. It was very much appreciated. Um, so I will begin the business portion of the meeting, which is a bit of a monologue on my part, but I'll uh, try to keep it fairly brief so we can enjoy Nancy's lecture. Uh, let me start by uh, announcing about our membership. Uh, so as you know, I uh, hope you've enjoyed our free year of membership renewal for those members who were current last year. Uh, and that was to help us all through the hardship of this pandemic year. Uh, this year, 
created hardship in the way we ran things and time commitments for some people. So I hope you can pardon the bumpy road that we've had this year. Uh, we've also made a transition to a, a wild apricot membership management system and that's not complete. So we will be working on that. Uh, the pandemic did delay that a bit. Um, nonetheless, we do anticipate that change in the next few months. And as that happens, uh, be prepared to receive some automatically generated emails from the new system and eh, apologies if they repeat themselves or seem a little strange, we'll do our best to get that uh, smoothed out. I would very much like to thank um, our outgoing membership chair, David Mark, uh, and the membership committee member, e Evelyn Diesenhaus. They worked so hard this year under duress of job commitments and so forth. Uh, for all uh, new members, changes and renewals in process, uh, you, they've kept us truly afloat for these uncertain times. Um, and I would like to thank Anna Biggs um, uh, and her husband for supporting her in that as our incoming membership chair for taking on this role as we begin the, the full transition uh, for the new term uh, of the board starting in July and the membership uh, management of Wild Apricot. I'm also very pleased to say that we are not losing David Mark from the board, fortunately. So he will be continuing on in his role as a uh, public relations chair. Um, so I would like to note that uh, there are some delays in the membership renewal and the ballot, and those heavily reflect uh, my own tardiness in some of these issues here. So. Uh, you can place the blame on me, not on somebody else. Um, and so those things are going out. You'll probably see that pretty soon. And yes, there's a little bit of a difference in where they get sent at, at this time. Um, also a quick, quick reminder that our members uh, sometimes are getting targeted with email spoofing. And I just wanna say really quick that um, our societyforcalligraphy.org emails are not hacked but they do sometimes appear to be that way because the address is falsified in the phishing attempts. So it depends on your email client, what, lo what it looks like to you, but just know that we will never ask you to buy things or donate money on our behalf or anything like that. You can always check with the emails and phone numbers that you know for the people if you're suspicious and uh, especially be suspicious if you don't recognize the reply to email address. So I thank everyone who's been continuing to point these out and uh, we continue to keep putting messages out there about that. <clears throat> so the ballot this year, um, because we had a little bit of uncertainty going into it, I delayed its release. We will be sending this out soon now. So I'm gonna go over who's on the ballot and we'll face the challenges that we face on the ballot. Uh, so as um, Hava mentioned, uh, the president position is now open, and I'll talk about that in a bit, as well as the treasurer position, which is available, and I'll talk about that. Um, on the ballot this year for renewal will be Chris Ewan as re regional liaison, David Mark as public relations chair, Sylvia Kowal as publications and circulations, Carrie M.I. as workshop chair, and I wanna stop and thank Christy Darwick very much for last year, taking on the role of acting workshops chair and getting us through this year uh, to fill the vacated position last year. So thank you very much, Christy, for that. Um, and thank you also to the people who've joined the workshop chair committee. Uh, some, some of the positions starting with workshop chair will start to be in a committee uh, style where the chair will be on the board and committee members will consist of volunteers who help out with some of the details. And that's an easier system for everyone. And also membership chair, Anna Biggs, coming in to take over that position. Returning board members whose terms don't expire this year will be Vice President, Mina Taylor, Secretary, Marjorie Grace Sayers, Program Chair, Hava Gerber, uh, Outreach Chair, Jane Shibata, Exhibit Chair, Jane Kim, Website Manager, Susan Bland, and Circulations, Sylvia Kowal. And in addition to these positions, we have um, other longtime volunteers uh, doing things such as Carol Hicks sending out the e-bulletin and um, Karen Gable is working on the directory and other things. So, uh, and I'm sorry if I missed people, 
Uh, so thank you so much to the continuing board members um, and our volunteers. This will be an important year for volunteers. So let me get back to the treasurer and president positions that are open. Uh, first of all, for the treasurer position, there is no need to be any kind of accounting expert. Uh, we do hire a professional accountant to square the books and a professional firm to do the taxes. So that greatly eases the role of the treasurer. Uh, this is one of our areas of greatest volunteer needs. So please do get in contact with HAVA if you have any interest and you could help us out in this area. As for the president position, um, let me just start by expre expressing my gratitude for the opportunity to serve SFC in this capacity for the last uh, almost two years. I have very much learned and grown in this role and hopefully been able to give something back to this wonderful organization. Um, however, it is time for me to leave this role. And I know that this past year has created a lot of unexpected changes and challenges for all of us uh, and for me too. So that's a big part of that. Uh, for the next person who takes on this role, know that the board has been devoting time and effort into parsing up the tasks of the president, actually, as well as all the board positions. So this will, role will be well supported and can be supported in the committee structure where some of the tasks are parsed to a president committee. Um, our board is a wonderful group of people that are enjoyable to work with, and especially in this future that uh, in the proper time frame, uh, we will start to be having in-person events again. So I hope that anyone with an interest in working with our board at this exciting time will not hesitate to get at, in touch and find out more. And you can certainly find out more with no obligation on yourself. We appreciate hearing from you. Uh, okay, so please get in touch with me or Hava or anyone else on the board if you're interested, and we'd love to see you. Um, so a brief uh, update on our COVID response. Uh, hopefully we're all beginning to enjoy life post-vaccination. As the state moves towards reopening, we still have a ways to go before SFC will be able to host in-person events. Uh, the new board, which will meet next on July 11th, uh, will start to discuss this uh, possibility of returning to in-person events. In the meantime, uh, the process that we approved during the pandemic requires all in-person events and protocols to be approved by the board prior to the event being scheduled. So there will be some delay if anybody has um, a suggested in-person event. For our members' safety, we will have to navigate along with new um, health orders and uh, new Cal OSHA workplace rules, which are state rules governing workplace environments which will continue to have restrictions, especially in the presence of unvaccinated individuals. So there, please have patience with us uh, and the organization as we navigate all of these uh, things to come. And finally, um, I'm going to conclude this business portion. I kept it short for you, uh, but I would like to invite all of us to reflect on this past year. Certainly there have been challenges and losses and there have been changes. But I hope that for most of us, calligraphy has been a wonderful source of solace and strength. And what a surprise the success of Zoom classes has been. I hope that you have all been overdoing it with Zoom classes as much as I have. So thank you all for the wonderful memories over the past two years, and they will continue. And I hope to see you all in future workshops and some of you at Letters California Style next year. All right, so I would like to now introduce uh, Angie Vangelis. Um, I hope I said that name right. I'm sorry if I didn't. Uh, Angie is president of the Texas Lettering Arts Council. She's the director of this year's Legacies Three International Lettering Arts Conference and the co-editor and designer of the Speedball Textbook, the 24th Centennial Edition. So with uh, no further ado, I will turn it over to Angie to uh, introduce or to give you some points about uh, Sorry. the moderation. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, switching spotlights and all that. OK. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you for having me today uh, as moderator for Nancy Uchida House. Um, we 
I had a little glimpse of what you're going to see only a little bit. She wouldn't show me everything, but I think you're going to, you're in for a big treat. Uh, and I have a couple of housekeeping um, habits to keep in mind. Uh, if you think of a question during her presentation, if you could just uh, precede the question with three question marks or a capital Q and a colon, I'm going to put that in the, um, in the chat here real quick so that you just as a reminder and um we'll take questions after her presentation so and also if you'll please stay muted um and i think that's about it so and i'll hand it back over to jennifer thank you uh so i will introduce uh nancy in 1964, uh, Nancy Ochita Howells began studying calligraphy with uh, Yaki Sparin at Portland State, moving to Los Angeles, took almost all of the SFC workshops, a year long class with Donald Jackson, and finally was awarded the art facility, uh, sorry, art faculty scholarship at Cal State LA, earned a master's degree in art and design. Nancy met David Howells at the July 1979 Cerritos College workshops organized by Larry and Marsha Brady. In 1984, her marriage to David brought her to Sussex, England, where David taught full-time for 32 plus years at Leicester College uh, of Art, later Polytechnic, and 40 plus years at Newston Hall. They taught together at Lansing College for 21 years. Nancy organized her own classes locally, as well as teaching solo in Germany, Belgium, UK, and USA. Her work has been commissioned by the Crafts Council. She held two one-person exhibits for Japan 20, uh, 2001 and exhibited in the Fitzwilliam Library, Cambridge and the Klingspor Museum. She is the author of the book, Calligraphy, Easel Does It. Nancy and David enjoyed a simple active life in a charming cottage where David would set up his easel and paint the flowers in the back garden. Nancy had to learn the British sense of humor as we heard earlier and way of life, but has adapted well and continues to live in Sussex. So with no, no further ado, we'd love to hear from you now, Nancy. What's this? It's a soccer ball, isn't it? You, you use it for playing soccer. In England, they call it football. And you're used to the elliptical, brown leather ball, which in England is called rugby and it's passed backwards. You don't, you don't pass it forwards, you pass it behind you. And, you're, and I'm sitting there and saying, these are big sports. These are, these are really popular sports. And do you mean, to, you mean to tell me that the name is different <laughs> between America and England? Well, that gives you some idea of the extent of it all. Um, now, I'm gonna to try to see if I can get onto the slides here. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna show you a little bit about when I first met David and let's see. So I go share screen, I think, is that right? Yeah. Yep. Share yep. screen, the big yep. arrow. And choose and the window go, that has the PowerPoint in it. Oh. Uh, uh, not the PowerPoint, sorry, Keynote. <laughs> uh, it's got the Dropbox in here again, sorry. I don't want Dropbox, I don't want Dropbox. So if you go to share screen at the bottom of the Zoom window. Yeah, green, green arrow. Green window, yes. and then choose the window you want us to see. Okay, so should I hit the little arrow or the big arrow? The big arrow, the big, big arrow. green arrow, yeah. The big, yep. It still comes up Dropbox. Oh, God. Uh, what should I do here? I don't um, want to okay. share at the bottom. A dro Dropbox has some, somehow come into this here. Okay. okay so I'm going to go back oh. to Zoom US. Christy, do you want to pause the recording real quick? Where do I press? Uh, 
Got it. Just so now go to slideshow at the top. Okay. Got it. Got it. Right. Slideshow at the top here. Mm -hmm. Slideshow. Ah, oh, there we are. Okay. Okay. Play from the start. Yep. Okay. Right. Get down there. There you go. Is that the first? Okay. So we got these messages. Oh, chat messages. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna go. Um, you go to minimize. Yeah, I gotta minimize this thing. Where's the cursor here? Oh, oh, this is this is. The, I I want the one where I can press the timing on the thing. I think you can do that just by pressing your space bar. Okay. And the left and right arrow keys should move you back and forth between images. Ah. Uh, oh. Yeah. You need to okay. overcome this, yeah, okay. switch off this chat thing. Okay, where's the cursor now? I don't yeah. need that, switch it off. Okay, here we go, yeah. Oh, here we go. Um, where, is the, where is the arrow here? Where are you, arrow? You just press admit. Oh, is that there's someone else organizing yeah. it? Yeah, something press. else. Oh, here we go. These are these, these are all the chats. Yeah, you just want to get rid of that. Okay, where's the arrow? Where's the arrow? Hmm. Why? Okay. Um, can you can you get it in there? In there? Can you find me the the arrow here? Oh, there it is. There, there, it, there is. it is. Yeah, That's yeah, it. Press the red one. That's okay. it. There we are. Right. That's it. That's it. So, um, left and the right will move it forward and backwards. Right. Can you see this? Can you all see this? You can the, see some the, colorful peas and some okay, squares. Right. Okay, yeah. that's where we are. Okay, right. Uh, should, Masato, can I go, go forward or backwards yeah, on this? You press this or that. It doesn't go backwards. Okay, how about this? Please. Okay, right. Down or up? Down, no. down or up? No. Forward or if you right click on it, you can end show and then re host it and then press spacebar to pause. Okay. That may oh be God. Yeah. What did you say? Yeah, right click. Right, right click it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 It'll bring up the menu. So when you oh. right click, oh, you know. there you go. You there had the go. menu. Okay, right. Oh, you and then the let's click video. end show and we'll start again. Gosh. I'm sure, yeah. I'm okay. Sorry. Back to the beginning. Now yeah. double click. So scroll up where you see 14 15 16 on the left hand side of the screen okay. yep. Scroll the mouse wheel up to get to the first page okay right that's it david house double click right. on the first image yeah that's right and then click slideshow at the very top next to tools and window you know, Masato, you're fantastic. This is my she nephew. Is very, very good. Yeah. Slideshow. Very good. Yeah. I'm a yeah. professional. Like, what Masato? Play from start. Um, and then let's do play from current slide. Play from current yes, slide. Yeah. Okay. And then click space bar to pause. Yeah. Okay. It's close enough, eh? Close enough. Close Can we enough. work with this? This is not exactly what I was going to do, but anyway, this is great. Okay, awesome. so so the space bar, and we can start again. Starting now. Yeah. Space bar, no. Nancy, we're starting now. I think you're ready. I think you're okay. all right. Okay. Well, I I the space bar. How does she move on, Matt Masoto? Masoto. Um, do the if you right click. Right. on the middle of the screen and then click next slide that'll let you go to the right or to the okay. left that's it okay that's it yeah. well this is not exactly what i had planned but anyway we're going to continue with this we're, we're talking about using the automatic pen and broad edge pens for both writing and for illustration and these are some um, seagulls that david had written and we say written because he didn't always like to say the word draw i can Write the seagulls is what he would say. And I'm going to show you some of this beautiful writing with thicks and thins. This is the rustic hand. Can you all see this? 
Okay. This is the yes, rusty can. Yes, we can hand. see it. Great. And it, it's, it is about four inches tall, uh, each of the letters. So this is on a very large sheet of paper requiring a lot of hand movement and arm movement coming down. It's a beautiful hand. Let's see. Let me go this in here. Space bar here. Uh -huh. Yeah, we right. This. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay, where's this? Where's this thing again? Oh, can you find the arrow for me? Why don't you okay, just sir. admit this person? You need uh, to, you need, no, you need, no, no, you need to get, put your cursor on there and just admit that person. Okay. Because otherwise they're locked out. Oh, okay. Um, no, she doesn't have to do that. Christy and I are letting people in. Into Lawrence. She doesn't have to worry about okay. that. Okay. Can you get your cursor on there, Chris? Uh, can you help me find the cursor? That, is that the cursor? Oh, it's we it's lost little, it. There it is. Okay. Okay. There it is. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go this here. David received his inspiration from walking in the countryside and, at a, and by observing nature. And when I was in England, he would say, come on, put on your jacket, let's go for a walk. No matter what the weather, no matter what was raining, hailing, snowing. And as we walked through the tall bushes, which became pathways, he would ask me questions like, what color is growth? And I would say, what color is growth? I, I guess it's green. <laughs> he said, wrong, it's not green. Look, don't assume that you know what something is until you've questioned it. And what he did is that he made me observe things as they really are, rather than guessing what I thought they were. And the growth is not green. It actually is red. And I couldn't believe it. And I went from plant to plant, and I looked at different things, and it may be only red for a day or two before it gets the chlorophyll to, to fill it up with the, uh, with the green. But it was quite amazing to me that you come to objects and you think you know what they look like, you think you know what they are, and it's not. And one thing that drawing has done for me is to actually teach me a great deal about observation and looking at truth rather than what you think it is. So when we did our watercolors, we oftentimes try to imitate some aspect of nature, the colors, the form. Here we've got a little bit of the blue sky with a bit of chalk. And notice that the background is filled with texture. If you think about nature, it doesn't like a vacuum. It doesn't have a whole lot of huge white spaces. And what's amazing is that you can make letters appear quite strongly like that's the only thing um on the end you can see that the the leg there is very narrow just holding in a little bit of that red paint now here i'm just going to go back one here that is the preliminary work for the flowers here's flowers for you hot lavender mint savory, um, looks like marmalade, but it's not marmalade. Um, and it's, it's a working layout. And what he's doing is he takes the pen and instead of writing it at a steady 45 degree angle to get the same thicks and thins on all the verticals, he manipulates the pen so that he gets a vertical line, which is thin, where he holds the pen at an angle and then a thicker pen line where he holds the pen flatter and is able to get a thick black line. So he has the kind of interplay between thin lines, thick lines, thin lines, thick lines. And that makes the whole texture very interesting. It actually changes the, the way the lettering reads rather than keeping it all consistent. He's now made it an interplay of thicks and thins. And there it is here. Here's flowers for you, lavender. And this time he's used it with colors. So you've got colors here going. And he starts off with blobs of, of watercolors. 
and then he accents it with the thinner pen to just illustrate whether it needs to be more or less to clarify what the letter is. He doesn't do it on all of them. He, he makes it a little bit like a mystery, looking into the lettering, trying to discover what he's written, but giving you hints so that you know what the saying is. And that's really important because it's not obvious. So it's, it's a little bit like a game of trying to discover what has he written. And he always makes it readable, but it might take you a little bit longer. I think a lot of the people today are making things unreadable and they think that's the modern way of doing calligraphy. But David felt quite different. He felt that in a way it should be readable, but takes a little bit longer. So there's the whole piece. Here's flowers for you. And it's so colorful, isn't it? It's all done in watercolors. It's about uh, two by three feet, 18 by 25 inches or so. Now, as he became older, what was interesting is that a lot of his students became professional art directors, designers in, in London. And he was being asked by his students to do lettering, <clears throat> excuse me, to do lettering for them. And this is, was part of a calendar. You can see 1992 in the, in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. And this is made for a printer uh, and a designer. And it was a kind of like a, a modern haiku uh, wanting illustration. So can you read it? Can you read it? They're all muted. Consider so the past muted. and you will know the battle. No, is that what it you said? Know the future. Future, pardon me. <laughs> future. <laughs> Consider the past and you will know the future. That's correct. That's fine. But again, there's this play that the verticals are very thin skeletons and the horizontal lines are nice, bold, thick, rich lines. And so it creates an interesting texture. Hello, Sue. Yes. Okay, so these are his roses. He would go out at all weathers to, to, uh, to illustrate the roses. And he used an automatic pen for these as well. He took letters which were uh he took let strokes that you use for making letters for making petals for making flowers and leaves and he, he blobs it with a brush first and then identifies it and clarifies it but with the use of a thinner line using the automatic pen and the colors were were marvelous in fact if you take a look at the pollen heads on one of the roses you'll see that it's many multicolors. It was, it was marvelous to watch him work because he actually works quite quickly. And, and he's quite bold. What's amazing about David was that he was a quite a, a quiet sort of shy man. And then you to find out that he's got this kind of incredible courage to make these very dramatic layouts was a wonderful experience. There's a close up of that. Yes. And the, the, the lines and everything are so playful. I mean, it's not like a, 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 a biological dissection of a rose. It actually is, has the more of the flavor and the feeling of the rose waving in the wind and the fragrance coming across the field rather than this is a photographic reproduction done in watercolors, like a botanical drawing. He loved the way that the rain would affect the lettering. And this is basically how water affects the ink and the flow of the lines. So here you have a rain cloud, a thunderstorm. And as you write on it with a pen, the ink spreads and is washed like the rain would wash the mud or the ink on your pavement. Pavement, by the way, is another uh, English American uh, phenomena. Pavement in America means where the cars go. And in England, they don't have the word sidewalk. So they use the word pavement. This is a song by uh, the gospel singer. Um, 
did it rain? Did it rain? <laughs> it rained all over. Um, well, my husband made it very clear that there were dietary requirements to our relationship. And he insisted that I learn how to make marmalade, which is kind of a bitter, bitter orange available just in the early months of the year, about January for a few weeks. And if you missed it, you missed it. Um, so, and what I discovered was that marmalade, there's many different recipes for marmalade. And every year I would try another one and another one. And he would eat nearly a, a pound a week. So, so let me tell you, it, it's, it's, it's hard work being a, a wife sometimes. Oh, domestic calligraphy. Okay, what are we doing here? Ah, here we go. Domestic calligraphy. <coughs> isn't that isn't that gay to have a label like that out there to put on a jar? And I use the word gay to mean colorful and bright and cheerful, and it, it just it's like it adds a sparkle to your day. Oh, oh what? Come on. End show. No, no, come on. We got some more here. <laughs> ah, oh, here we go. There's the marmalade. There he is. Okay. Early years. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Sussex, where we live. Uh, we live on the south coast of England. And England is quite a small country uh, in terms of geography. Uh, if you take England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales and put it all together, guess what state it would be equivalent to in the United States? Would it be as big as Texas or Alaska? Michigan. New Jersey? New it's, Jersey. No, no, it's, it's the size of Oregon. Oregon, Oregon. Oregon, about, yes. When David was born, they had, they didn't hardly have any cars or electricity. Uh, they had a little bit of gas. The previous was outside in the back garden. Uh, things were, were pretty basic. And these houses had basically a room or two upstairs and a room or two downstairs connected by a stairwell. It faced the sea and that's why he loves the ocean. That's his mother at 10 years old. Oh, and then, oh, that's David here. Let's go back here. Let's, that's David, the, probably the earliest picture we have of him. And do you notice he has dark hair? Lots of dark hair. And, and awful teeth. The British don't take care of their teeth like the Americans do. The Americans like, like it's straight and, and all white. Uh, the American uh, spend a lot of money on getting their teeth straight. In, in England, it's quite different. They, they kind of just accept you as you are. Even the queen mother had quite yellow teeth because they all drink tea and it stains the teeth. Okay, he was a boy scout, went out camping. Okay, which one of these uh, is David here? Let me see. Oh, 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 let's go back here. He's not in this picture. Okay, he's oh, he's behind the people here. Uh, he's behind Masato here. Can you see these? I think I think I have to just go to the next slide. Is he on the right? He's on the right. Yes, yeah, behind the people's spaces. Move the gallery, but I don't know. How you yeah, know. well, I think I would just go yeah. to the next picture. Yeah, yeah go. Let's see. Where are we? Yeah, I'll come back. Can this you way. get this person in? Oh, yeah. That's, That's him. him. Yeah. He went to a very small parish church school. And he told me that one of his first memories was actually when the tutor, the teacher, went up to the black slate board and taking a piece of chalk with white chalk drew a box 
and she drew it three dimensionally so that it, it looked like it was coming out from the background. And he said he couldn't figure it out. He walked to the back of the board and he could see that the box didn't come through. And he couldn't figure out how this box could be three dimensional and be flat on the board. And that's one of his first interests in art. Uh, he, he won a scholarship at the age of 11. They take an examination and they either send you to a technical school or, or uh, what do you call it, 11Zs or something to search. And he took the examination and he won a bursary, which it means it's like a scholarship or money to attend Worthing High School for boys. It was also a Worthing High School for girls, but they kept them separate. And that was extraordinary because most people who grow up at, in a local parish church school uh, never have the experience of going to a, a uh, what do you call it, a, 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 a more of a proper it's a school. Grammar school isn't it's it? a grammar it's school. Grammar school. Yeah. They, have, they have all these names in England for different schools, but it's quite confusing because I find that they say things like um, public school. Public school. <laughs> now, public school in it's America private. would be something that would be state funded. But in, in England, a public school is, is you have to fund it yourself, which costs Private. 10,000 of pounds to, per term. Mm. And they have to wear certain kinds of uniforms and things of the sort, and there's certain kinds of rituals. Uh, it's a very, very exclusive uh, education, actually. So public school is, is very expensive in England, whereas it's state free in, in America. He has the one characteristic that I thought was very interesting. He holds all these uh, uh, things in his pockets. And when he was older, I was going to try to send his jacket to the cleaners. Uh, and I thought you should take everything out of the pockets. Well, let me tell you, it took like a couple of hours to take all the things out of his pockets. He had pencils and erasers and paper clips and plastic bags and string and a couple of knives and uh, things that, things, the ordinary things that you expect a person to have. But then he had extraordinary things as well. He had a diary, address book, postage stamps, envelopes. And it was just, just uh, highly amusing. I mean, it filled up, he even had string, string. So he was like a walking desk drawer. And he fit that into his pocket and he was, it was, so his pockets always stuck out. But if you wanted anything, you'd say, hey, David, do you have a, a plastic bag? Do you, have a, do you have a pair of mittens? My hands are cold. He would pull something out and it would be what you had asked for. It was like a, a magic jacket. Now, when he was 15, after three years of being in the Worthing High School, he had to choose which career he was going to go into. And he had no money. He had no, no family to back him. And the depression was on at that time. So his, his future looked very bleak. And he decided to take the examination for the Halton, which is the RAF School of Engineering. Now, if he passed this, the exam for three years of training that he receives, he would have to serve for 12 years in the military to pay them back for his tuition. And he decided to go that way because he wanted to get away from being on the South Coast, just being a, a sailor or a, a mariner. And he wanted a change of life. So he decided to go for that. And this is the first drawing that he did uh, for the school, uh, Halton School uh, magazine. And he had art in Worthing High School for Boys. He also had French and German. And both of these would be, would hold him in good stead in the future. He also had to memorize long passages of poetry, which he found tedious, but, but as an adult, he found it very useful. Do you notice that on the lower left-hand corner, his name, David House, is in um, a design. So this is a pen and ink drawing. And that's his uniform. All the girls love a uniform. And what was amazing about Halton is that there were no trees on the, on the area at all. And I asked what happened to the trees? And they said, they were all cut down 
for the uh, trenches in World War I. Every tree was cut down. Oh, come on now. And here you can see his interest in decorative lettering already. And the Halton Magazine, summer of 1936. And this is, I think, very interesting. Look at the characters, caricature of this man. Proud. Uh, it looks like he's got uh, almost uh, above his medals, the ribbons are all in decorative forms. So he spent a lot of time working out pen and ink drawings for decoration. Uh, the passing out parade. This is a uh, graduation day. And they put the tallest at one end and so the shortest at the other end so that the line looks consistent. They, are, they do look young, don't they? Okay, nine, 10, pull. He was stationed and sent to uh, Northern Africa, uh, where when he arrived, they had very little facilities there. Um, he, they, they lived in these, basically these tents and the sun would come up and there'd be sand in everything, you know, in your nose and your food and your clothing and everything. And of course, when they were sent to Northern Africa, there were no barracks or places for them to live in. They had to live basically in the, in the middle of this wasteland, protecting their airplanes. Now, 40,000 men graduated from the Halton uh, Engineering School. And they soon became the best engineers for airplanes and jets. He started off with the tiger moth a biplane, that gives you some idea of the time, uh, you know, you know, uh, who, who's that famous German um, pilot? Uh, Red Baron, wasn't it? That was a biplane. There's a signature. Oh yeah, here we go. That's a very a smart uh, haircut and mustache, isn't it? Well, of course, with the war, they couldn't say anything about where they were. So he says, so he's made this Christmas card from somewhere in Africa. Just where I am, I hate confess. So take a pen and make a guess. Everything was, um, of course, during the war was, um, was censored. And he was runner up in a art contest. There's this book now. He ended up in India at the time of the partition when it was very dangerous for people to be British and he disobeyed a, a, a rule from his officers because they wanted the men to take the train down to the coast and then take a ship back to England. And they all said, no way, we're not going that way because uh, they were being pulled out of trains and hacked to death. So uh, he disobeyed his first lesson there. Now, when, he, when David became older, he, he seemed to want to go back to the old memories of his younger days. And he did that by, by being involved with the, uh, the ex-apprentices that were uh, retired. And those are his medals. And there was a competition. Oh, and the competition asked for a tribute to be built for the RAF for the 40,000 men to, not a memorial, but a tribute because they were now the heads of international airlines, military and civilian all over the world. Remember, Britain still had the Commonwealth, which is 54 countries. And some of the countries are big like England, not in, like Canada, India, Pakistan. Um, and this was the first project they all did, which is taking a block of iron and filing it until they became a certain measurement. And then they had a brass cube that had to be filed. And the brass cube had to go in any direction. Well, of course, after one day or so, they had a chisel and a hammer 
Their hands and knuckles were bruised because they had missed and hit their fingers. So it was all bloody and wet. And that was the symbol of the, of the tribute. It's on a diagonal. It costs over 50,000 pounds to, to make. It was originally going to be in slate and now it's in granite. Oh, go back a step here. What was incredible about the tribute is that because David had, well, David and I had spent so much time on it that we were given permission to, uh, to be introduced to the queen. And that was uh, one of the highlights of David's life. I mean, he just was thoroughly thrilled. But it was an amazing day for me because uh, we, had to, we had a booklet of instructions and when the queen drove up in her car, she has a royal standard, a special flag that they put up. And suddenly out of the sky came screeching, roaring jets really low and the ground shook. I went, Woo! with a huge sound. And actually it made me tremble from head to toe. It was such a, 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 a timing. And the queen was lovely, but several surprises for me. She was very small. She's probably less than five feet tall. She has radiant eyes and a beautiful complexion. And we were given all these rules like, don't touch the queen. If you speak to the queen, you say ma'am, which rhymes with spam. And I thought that was a kind of a, uh, uh, not a very uh, high class uh, way to remember it. Uh, she has to uh, shake hands with a certain number of people. So they say, Instructions like don't press her hand, let her reach for your hand. Um, you know, don't push her up, you know, don't push the arm up and down a lot because otherwise she'll fall over. And she had rest stops, 20 minutes here and there. I was amazed because I had uh, uh, the impression that the queen could do a lot of things. And the, what I saw that day was that I thought that she was the most controlled person I had ever met. She had to be in a certain place at a certain time. And she stood for hours as they had the graduation parade. Uh, they put a new flag in. She had to uh, plant a tree, open a museum. There were 5,000 people on the air base uh, because of the uh, unveiling of the tribute. And they make a toast. And the toast is, I thought it was the royal toast. It's not. It's the loyal toast, L-O-Y. Oh, L, the loyal toast. I was just amazed at the organization of getting everybody timed just perfectly so that the airplanes and jets would come through. Um, the British are fantastic about organizing their parades and things. This is the, the tribute in winter. Many of the apprentices uh, have had their ashes, uh, uh, what do you call it, spread below the tribute. And many of them wanted to be shown touching the tribute when they had their photographs taken. Well, David, David became uh, one of the leading designers for this. Uh, I, even though I say David, I mean, we both worked on it because the thing is huge. I mean, it was six feet square for the bottom uh, stone, another two or three feet for the upper stone. Well, we don't have like a drawing board that's nine feet wide. So we had to use the floor in the kitchen or I had to do the floor in the kitchen. So it was hard work. Uh, now that he was the 29th entry and this is the stained glass window that went in the church. He did, he, he wrote these out. This is Churchill's famous uh, quotation. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. A battle of Britain. And uh, I said, to when I first met David, I said, oh, there's a target on the, uh, on your calligraphy. And I was quickly corrected. That is not a target, that is an insignia. That's the badge of the Royal Air Force. And uh, so, so don't use the word target. And these are, um, what do you call it, jet uh, flows. Uh, when the engine goes by and you get a little bit of that white mist, jet trails or airplane trails from the engine. And the sky was full of them after the Battle of the Britain. And David really loves that. He, he thought that it was great because he loves making 
with wispy motions with the pen, which reflect the jet trails. Went to Brighton College of Art. That's his teacher, Anne Gaston, his calligraphy teacher. If you'd see the way she's dressed, you'd think this is from another age. And she's got this kind of uh, ivory boat brooch around her neck. She was wonderful for David. He learned how to make patterns and simplify shapes. And how to use the pen for drawing all kinds of animals and ornaments. His course was a three, well, it was a five year course, full time, Monday through Friday. And they were, each of the students was given a desk, an area to work in the studio with closets. They even had meal tickets. I thought they were really spoiled compared to us American students who have to work very hard to just you know, finance ourselves and get to the classes. And then we're only allowed to stay there for two or three hours. And then we have to go find somewhere else. So simplify shapes. And these are the, uh, uh, these fishes of Brighton. And then he incorporates it into a piece of writing. So here you can see it's, a, it's a trying to get different pieces of writing to fit on a sheet. And there's different textures. Some of them are double line, some of them are single line, different sizes. There he is as a young man. He was lucky to have come out of that desert uh, without uh, it being ill. He did, he did get dysentery and he lost all this weight. The men were really, really vulnerable. Uh, to finance his way through art school, he, he got a job uh, for the Evening Argus, the local newspaper, and once a week he produced a sports cartoon. And these are characters from all sorts of sports, bicycling, darts, hockey, ice hockey, field hockey, um, cricket, etc. And he would write it, he'd attend the game on Saturday, and he had to have the artwork finished by Tuesday morning so it could be printed in the paper. That's a hard way to make a living, actually. He did it one a week. And then he had to make a thesis for the finishing of his course. Um, and these are shop signs. And these uh, rounded things on the buildings are pebbles, flints from the sea, which they push into the concrete because it's cheap building material. And these are the shop signs that he found so intriguing. And also the roof line is completely different from shop to shop, the window design, the height of, of the windows. That's the College of Art. Well, he started off by teaching uh, Edward Johnson's uh, formal italics um, and condensed tense when he began. But after a few years, the host school changed. He also found out that on his appointment as being uh, a lecturer or a teacher at the college, he also had the title of City of Leicester calligrapher, in which he had to do many certificates. Uh, and formal things. Over the years, he gradually changed his designs from being very formal to, again, this really restless pen activity with movements of the pen flourishes. Well, here he is with some of his students here. And he took me to the Klingspor Museum. Uh, one of the famous uh, calligraphy collections in the world. And these are some pages from his notebook. These are about uh, six by eight inches. And he had 50 pages of notes from a visit. He spent a week there recording and drawing um, the artwork that was uh, there so that he could understand it and teach it. And I can tell you that that is really worthwhile doing. This is a cornerstone uh, that he made for a church and it was made in poured concrete and this is a plaster cast of it. 
So this section is about different materials. Fabric, writing on fabric for the students who are fashion designers. Wood. Uh, can, you, can you read what the word is? It's dance. That's right, it's dance. Very well seen. Who said that? It's Very me, good. Huh? Very good. You, you got it. It's dance. You're right. Absolutely correct. That was quick. Well done, you. Two and four in ceramics. Because at the art college, he had all these different departments in ceramics, glass, shoe, illustration, weaving. And there he is there. Uh, this is one of his Christmas, early Christmas cards. And it was in gold block. And he loves these flourishes. The National Trust uh, preserves old buildings and property. Oh, wedding and sequence. I thought at first the word was C. I said, what's the word C doing there? He said, sequence. English spoke, American understood. Now, there it is. If we had a, an argument or anything, it was usually because of the language we used and that the words had different definitions and meanings than they have here. He would say things like, oh, don't be stupid. And I go, oh, that sounds horrible. And he said, stupid in, in British English means something like, don't be silly. As opposed to, if you said that in America, people would think you were very insulting. There we are. My mother's wedding dress. Um, her pearls, David's RAF tie, and there's our logo for the day. This is the picture that Shaba likes so much. Well, I drew, I sent letters to David all the time because he, he didn't like being uh, on his own. And this is done with oil crayon. And if you could take a look at the background, you see that it's an alphabet. Can you see there's A and then there's B, C, D, E. Uh, is it S, T, U? Can you see that? It's a bit vague. And of course, we, he made Christmas cards and I wrote a holiday letter. If you take a look at this illustration, you'll notice that something's wrong. Can you see it? Something's wrong. Anyone detect it? The flag. The flag poles are on the wrong side. The no. flag is, is on the wrong side. That's right. Yeah. It's, it should be the you get the stars next to the flagpole rather than the other side. Correct. Well, the robin in England is a very small bird with a very orangey red breast. And in America, it's a much bigger bird, like almost like a, a thrush with quite brownish uh, uh, feathers. So he loved the, uh, the robin that comes. And he made these uh, Christmas cards. Here's some uh, layouts of his designs here. And this is, this is how he works. This is the back of an envelope or something of this sort. Just scratches all these birds. And he loves birds, uh, adores birds. And so the bird is almost like his logo. His, there we are. Uh, the male is, has the red breast and the female uh, is just brown feathers. So, so there he is with a little bit of color. Uh, we had bell ringing on our summer schools at Lansing College. And these are some of the bells that he, he, we had, hand bells. And the students would practice for about two hours and then give a little concert at the course. And after he printed the cards in black on white paper, he then took a paintbrush and painted, hand painted in all the yellows and reds and conflict colors. It was a big job because we did about 400 cards a year. Now, hold on, where are we? Next. 
Okay, here, I'm just gonna go ahead here a little bit more. Okay, City of Leicester. Again, he loved flourishes and the movement of the pen across the paper, just like the jet trails, and he used them for the flourishes. We made projects in our classes, real projects. And we made a whole series of cookbooks, about five cookbooks, address books, birthday books, poetry books, an apron, five or six uh, linen tea cloths, and aprons. Now this is how he started his class. He was quite a remarkable teacher. He didn't start off with alphabet and, and pen work. He started off with texture and rhythm. And he respected his students and their work and he drew great inspiration from the students. And this is how he taught his classes. That This is my sheet here. But can you see how bold he is? And also he's got thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin, thin, thick. You can see how it is, it's a rhythm of pattern, roses. He loves the wild rose that grows in, as a bramble in the hedgerows. And he'd go out and in, even in very bad weather and paint the roses and then come back and add the calligraphy to it. Here's some, here's some examples of some roses. There you go. What amazed me is all the different layouts he does. He's got the roses uh, above or on the side or through the middle. And it's not easy thinking of different sorts of layouts for projects. The daffodil. There we go. And getting the trumpet to, to have that neck that bends over on the daffodils. And the poetry, these are the passages that he had to memorize as a young boy at Worthing High School for boys. And then he uses them now for writing them. This is from um, Gilbert and Sullivan. Ta-ra, 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 ta-ra. All different kinds of layouts. He wrote this in pencil and then added the color, watercolors. And the one thing that I think I influenced David was that he, he started to use much more color after he met me. This was marvelous. We were driving home one day after teaching and we came up to, up to the top of the hill and suddenly the gray skies, which had been raining, broke out and there was a crack in the clouds and this yellow sunset, reddish rose sun light came through. And it really was dramatic. And we went home and I could hear David in the studio. And he had taken and just did the landscape with the gray clouds, the sun set, the blue sky underneath that, and then the dark green pastures. And later he came back a few days later and did the, the, the daffodils and words. But he, he had this impression in his mind and he said, I've got to capture that. So he immediately went out and you could hear the shuffling of paints and brushes and painted the, the piece of work. These were so popular that they basically used these for uh, uh, a commission by the Edward Johnson Foundation. And if you take a look at this wild sort of thing, you wonder what some of these things are. Can you see the fairies up in the upper right hand corner, a little fairy with a wand and the badge. And then these are uh, lions. These are little uh, linear lions and dandelion seeds floating about. That's what amazes me about it is almost irreverent. Uh, these drawings are just like cartoon drawings. Oh, hearts alphabet. He's for February 14th. He sent me an alphabet of hearts and he called it the hearts alphabet. And from there, we, he made, went on to make prints for it. Would you believe it that this is a watercolor with the wash? It's not a photograph. 
you can take a look at the bottom here and you can see the white paper and the paint that goes up to the edge. We did an exhibition, uh, David, uh, Peter, Paul, Peach and myself. And there's are some more bells. We had, we had lovely, lovely bell, bell ringing times. One of the students, we have a thing called share time in our course. And every student who has something to, who wishes to share, something they enjoy, it doesn't have to be calligraphy, can bring it. And then we all share it together. And some of the most exciting things have come from that period of time. Okay, I'm gonna close on this. I think what, we, what I've learned from being in England is that money is not as important as being happy. That small is beautiful. And that people really matter. They really matter more than anything else. I think part of that is being away from my own family and friends in California and, and in Oregon. You miss them more. I mean, my people who live close to my parents would say, well, we'll drop by and say hello sometime or have lunch together, but they don't. But when I go and visit people and, and I come back to California or Oregon, or I really try to make a point of seeing my family, every single one of them, if I can. And I think that being far away makes you more um, reach for more for the people who you care about and it, you value the friendship more. And I can say that some of the people I've, I've missed so much in, or in Oregon and California are the calligraphers. You've been absolutely a wonderful group of people. I've gained so much from you over the years. Um, and, you know, people share really generously of their time. I mean, uh, the people who run for president and chairman and all the volunteers, you make things happen that would happen otherwise. So thank you very much for your friendship and for coming tonight. Take care. Thank you. Now, uh, what happens now? Okay, Angie. I have a, a, a quick you, little video, but, but we'll have some. Uh, we'll you, have some questions or anything like that. Uh, Does anybody I get have any questions in the chat? Does anybody have any questions for Nancy? I know I have one for you. And do you like marmalade? <laughs> I love marmalade. I love marmalade. Let me tell you, I mean, the British love their desserts and puddings and things of this sort. I mean, it's just incredible. They use the word pudding, which in America means like a custardy, runny sort of thing. But the, in England, pudding means things like a uh, hot apple pie, a suet pudding, um, you know, really uh, rich, uh, warm, uh, fattening, delicious, yummy. Because they don't they don't put up the thermostat so much and they walk a lot more. So so when I first came here, I hardly saw a fat person. But since then, I've noticed that the people are getting a bit wider. I think it's partly the lockdown. I mean, people don't get the exercise they want. Yeah, that's the COVID. I love I love marmalade. COVID way. It's really a, a wonderful dish. I had a question. You're working yeah. now on a book. Can you talk a little bit about the book that you're working on now, Nancy? Well, the, the book I'm trying to write is the book that David didn't finish. He started it a little bit, but he wasn't a, a writer type of person. And I thought it, it's nice to talk about the creative spirit in a way, because in a way that's the hardest thing that we have is to capture the, the beginning of an idea, the beginning, spark and trying to maintain that so that you can go through the whole experience of, of making something and feeling grateful for it. I also, for myself, I find that with calligraphy or, or these things, I really prefer giving gifts rather than just doing commissions. I'm not, that's one reason why uh, I, I'm not so keen on things like writing memorial books. I really like making things that, that add to the joy of a wedding or of a birthday or appreciating a certain person or what they've done because people are so brave and, and people do so much for other people. So I like calligraphy for making cards and gifts. 
that's what the book is about is about trying to understand the, the human spirit and creativity and how it, it takes us from things like um, the ordinary to the extraordinary. And the chat is full of gratitude. Everybody's saying thank you. Wonderful, inspirational, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Nancy. Thank oh. you so, so much. I enjoyed sharing uh, uh, you sharing charming life and uh, the presentation. Uh, loved it, Nancy. Thank you. Oh, that's uh, so nice. Yeah, there's it's uh, I'll save the chat for you so you can read all this. It's oh, beautiful. that would be marvelous. Thank you very much. Yes. Are there any other questions? There's just one comment here. It's a beautiful presentation. I would love a book of your presentation and David's artwork. It was so touching and lovely. Oh, uh, Michaela says calligraphers are gift givers. Thank you all for the art. <laughs> I just, excuse, I'm Michaela, a neighbor of Nancy's family. And I just want to say, having met David, what a beautiful tribute. I learned so much about him and the art was so much fun to see. And from the childhood, you can see David as that young person too. So thank you, Nancy. It was a beautiful presentation. And thank you, Masato, for helping out too. Um, yes. <laughs> and thank you all for being a room full of calligraphers. My goodness, the art. Thank you. Masato, you are great. Masato is my nephew, and he's he's, he's he's good at fixing computer problems. And I'm just so impressed at how how uh, incisive he is and how clear his directions are, and they work. <laughs> uh, that's really marvelous. Thank you, Masato. I, I, did many people come today? Yes, yeah, so, uh, there's 73 people on the on the call right now. Wow, think, that's yeah. great. Lovely. That's great. Um, well, I hope it wasn't too technical. No. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. So uh, if we don't have any other questions, does anybody else have any questions? Nancy, I want to say I started calligraphy here in Santa Monica in the early 80s. Yeah. I came to sessions, Linda Renner. We made a cookbook that I still have, and I loved the class, and I'm still doing calligraphy. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my Nancy, goodness. Yes. Can I just say thank you from Shoreham? Oh. From John and Joanne. Yes. Oh, thank you. thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Nancy, for a very entertaining evening. And not well, Nancy. Well, Joanne I think we... gave you some marmalade. Oh, thank you. I think what happens is that is that David was very shy about his background and he didn't talk about it very much. And a lot of people don't know that he did some really quite amazing things. I mean, to, to grow up, you know, in poverty and, and without uh, very much help from your family and to accomplish what he has done as really, really a, a very talented, spirited person. He wanted to be an artist and he, and he was an artist. I mean, he doesn't letter like anybody I've seen. I mean, do you know anybody who resembles his work? You can see people who copy other people, but his is really quite individual and unique. Mm -hmm. And he was very brave because when he would do his work, in the beginning, although he was a member of the SSI, a fellow, they would not display his work on the walls. They had it underneath the counter because they said it was too, it didn't fit in with the rest of the work. And he gave a talk about the Klingspor Museum, and they didn't ask him to talk again for 30 years. No. 30 years. And that gives you some idea of, of the kind of, huh? He was lucky to have you. <laughs> <laughs> we know, Nancy. We know. Wow. Oh, you yes. spoiled him, Nancy. Yeah. You spoiled him. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we had a great, wonderful relationship. I mean, we worked together so well. I mean, I grew up on a farm, but we had to work together as a team. He grew up uh, with this uh, military, uh, how do you say, uh, squadron. And they had to work together to keep the airplanes up in the air and to survive. And so we, when we came together, it, it seemed natural. We just worked together so smoothly. 
And we had been traveling a lot to teach classes in America and, and uh, Europe and abroad. And we came to the conclusion, this is killing me. I mean, I can't stand the, all the just the traveling demands and the temperature differences and the altitude differences. So we decided to have some classes of our own. And so we chose Lansing College, which is a beautiful college. And um, what's amazing about it was that we ran it for 21 years, two weeks a year. We rented the summer uh, term, a couple weeks in the summer term when the students were away. And it was marvelous. We had a, a, a steward that served us food in the, in the master's dining room. Marvelous, beautiful atmosphere. And, this, and we still get together with the students. So they're, they're such good, faithless people. You make friendships in calligraphy that you don't make anywhere else. So thank so Nancy, you. Nancy, would you like to uh, try showing your video? You oh, try well, that? okay, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> thank you, Nancy. Ike and Louise. Hi, Ike. Hi, Louise. Uh, so what we can do is, do you have the video queued up on the desktop? So. Yeah, I think so. Share. Okay. Share screen, can, green, up, green square. The green, the big green button. Share yeah. the screen. Yeah, I'm doing that now. Okay. Here we are. Here we go. Here is the video here. Okay. Let's go here. Right. Okay. And choose screen. Did you share, share your screen? And choose the screen you want to share. Yeah, I've just clicked that twice. Okay, uh, so do I, go down to the bottom where bottom right. It'll say share on the share. blue. Okay, right there. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay, there. Go. Uh, where's the where's the controls? Uh, there, there we you are. Okay. Pull your cursor away so that the the bar. bar will go. Um, we were we were brought up in the tradition of Johnston, and his writing, although he's a, a classicist, nonetheless uh, his later hands, especially that Johnston pointed at Tannock, is an extremely vigorous and active man, and 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 it's a delight to write. In fact, I think one of the the aspects of uh, lettering that I found is that it's such a, it gives me great pleasure in writing, as it's like drawing, these two mm -hmm. activities, great pleasure, which is part of why I took it all up. <laughs>
explain the subject. Writing with a broad pen, and it, it has to be there for a simplification of statement, and, and that's all I've been doing. I suppose it follows, it follows work with a pencil and studying the object, which I do, so I get to know the form, and then the, uh, the, the square pen can pick up these main linear movements that it has. That's the, that's the heart of it, I suppose. And the two, therefore, integrate ideally. And the students I had think they get all frustrated and, and throw it away and go back to black ink. Uh, because, uh, and the reason, quite simply, is that the paint dries on the pen. So I'm going to try and write into this, and although it shouldn't be absolutely dry yet. Which in fact is part of the charm of it. So you find, of course, it, it's, it needs judgment and it needs a little bit of practice to get to know it. But when it's not quite dry, you can use it and you get some intriguing qualities out of it. See here, it's just started to fuzz and it's started the ink a little bit. So there's a charming variation that you get simply because it's, it's a little bit uh, damp. Now it's starving, the pen starving is missing a little bit, but I'm going to leave it because it has some feature that it goes in. Mm. What I'm doing now is in the formal writing, the edge of the nib is at a, a fixed angle so that all the lettering is of the same character. What I'm doing now is deliberately turning it so that I can give myself a thin line here and then a thick line. In there, and so I can get some modulation in it all, as near as I can. I'm going to uh, I'm going to wet this a little bit. It's all dried up. This is what happens if it's a bit wet. Of course, you've got the more the diffuse texture, of course, the less easy it is to read. So one has to make a balance between these two issues. Finish the quote. Any questions for that? Is that all right then? <laughs> you just make yourself sound so beautiful. Well, it's a, question, yeah. it's a question of practice, isn't it? Especially mm -hmm. with this, this instrument, because it's a particular sort of instrument that you need to get used to. But once you can get used to the vertical position, and uh, the, the maintenance of dampness is a delightful instrument to use. And of course, it's very convenient because you can, uh, they're made of different sizes. And if you want a post to go outside the, the dining room, you can quickly write one out. And here we are. How's that? <laughs>
That was lovely. I know so, some of the connections were a bit brutally cut because we took it from different parts of a, of a two hour uh, video. And I just wanted to get the highlights of the principles of how David worked. And I just felt that in a way uh, we had to make cuts sometimes in a bit of a middle of a vowel or middle of a word. So apologies for the connections in the, but we wanted to just show you some of the principles of how he works. Well, I hope that was of interest to all of you. Yeah, can we see you look up, look up to the camera? Oh, there yes. we go. I'm, I know. see you off to the side there. <laughs> um, yes, Dan was saying, you're so right. David's writing is unique to David. Nobody else's writing looks like his. He has always been a huge inspiration to me since 1980 when I took his first week long class. Oh, I was Deanne Singh. Yeah. Where did, you, where did you take the week long class? At Deanne's place or? I don't know. Deanne? No, the Society for Calligraphy, we used oh, to have him. Yes. Yeah, we used to have him. Um, every year well every year every other year we'd have him for a week long in the summer that's right that's right i remember that now yes so you all knew david as well then oh yeah oh wow that's just wonderful that's well it's wonderful. from nancy i think you uh were you the first one to bring him over for those week-long classes yes when you were yeah. program chairman that's right that's right um, actually, the, the, um, we're looking at Larry Brady and Marsha Brady brought him to Cerritos ah. College for the first, first time. Ah. And what happened was that um, I, was, I was just retiring chairman at that point. Mm. And I said to him something like, um, good morning, Mr. House. Welcome to the United States. Is there anything you would like to see while you're here? And he said, Cowboys and Indians and Las Vegas. And I thought, oh my God. I mean, <laughs> cowboys, where am I gonna find cowboys and Indians? Anyway, we, we worked it out and he, he, um, he went to L Las Vegas and he took photographs of the, all the lights at night. And then um, he got on the Greyhound bus and went off to Indian country. And what frightened me was that he, he hitchhiked after he got off at Gallup. <laughs> and he hitchhiked into the desert area to Window Rock where they were having a, uh, a, uh, a rodeo. And of course, the problem was that he doesn't have much hair on top of his head and he was getting sunburned and he could feel the heat. And so what he did is he remembered the week before he had gone to Disneyland with uh, Larry Marsha Brady and of course, he had the uh, Mickey Mouse cap <laughs> with, the, with the badge around it. <laughs> and I thought, I don't think I would pick up anybody with a with a hat like that on. I mean, that would be too much, too much. And, uh, <laughs> Did he have ears? Was it no, Mickey no, Mouse no, ears? No, no, here. This is this is the this is the actual hat. I'm doing all these, I'm, I'm actually opening up all these boxes and things and finding all kinds of surprises. This is the hat here with Mickey Mouse on it here. Oh, <laughs> oh and well, then, then that's not so bad. We got data. Yes, the, the Mickey Mouse ears. No, they, didn't, they didn't have the Mickey Mouse ears on. But I don't think I would pick up a person walking in the middle of the desert with one of these hats on. <laughs> Well, he did get up to Window Rock, and being David and, and his kind of good naturedness, he was picked up after a couple of rides by a teacher who took him to the, uh, his school there after he was given a lecture about not hitchhiking in the, country, in the country, because although it looks like there's moisture, there's almost no water anywhere. And, you know, he could just get hit or anything, and nobody would know he was even there. Well, he... <laughs> At the end of the day, he, he judged an, a children's art uh, competition. And then he stay, went and stayed overnight with an Indian family. He arranged for that. and came back the next day and attended a rodeo and then flew back to Kansas City where he taught for Hallmark cards <laughs> and then went back to England. <laughs> and I'll tell, you the, I'll tell you a little secret he said to me on the telephone he said, before he left he says you know the best thing that happened to me in America 
was meeting you. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and on that note, we it's come to one o'clock in the end of our meeting. I'd like uh, to thank Nancy Cheetah House for, from our whole membership for a really wonderful speech and presentation on herself and on, on her husband, David House. I'd like to let the membership know that um, the record, we recorded the meeting today and it will be put up on our YouTube channel um, in a little bit. And uh, we're working on putting a link on our website to that YouTube channel. So please be patient and we'll get it up there. Um, and once again, uh, we want to thank Nancy. I want to thank um, Christy Darwick for her being the uh, facilitator and Angie Vangelis for being the moderator for this meeting. And I want to say thank you. And we're going to say goodbye. Take care. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. I really, it's lovely to see so many familiar faces. And I wish you the very best, and I look forward to seeing you again. So thank you very much. Thank and thank you, you Angie, for saving me. <laughs> yes, thank you, Nancy. Thank Thanks, you, Nancy. Nancy. Thank you, it was lovely. Thank you so much. Nancy. Thank you, 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 Nancy. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, bye. Masato. Bye-bye, Masato. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Masato. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Thank so you, I'll Jeff. go ahead and end the meeting or um, Nancy, if you have uh, any more chatting, I, I won't, don't have to end it immediately. Oh, well, well why don't we have go for 10 more minutes? Any, okay, any sounds good. Yes, Sandy, you have a question? Nancy, I just want to say it's so wonderful to see you again. I studied with you on Ocean Boulevard in the early 80s. Oh, and my spent goodness. Spent a week at Marymount College with David and you and the most cherished times of my life. You really had no idea how much I carried you in my heart all these years. And I love you and I thank you for everything. Well, thank you so much for coming and telling me. It's really, you made my day. I'm so happy that I can talk to you again. It's just, it, just wonderful. You bring me to tears, you honestly do. You're a big part of my life. Thank you, thank you very much. Janet, Janet Takahashi. Oh, she's gone, has she? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> oh, oh, I can't. Oh, oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to share that in the early days when I used to study with Nancy on uh, on Ocean Park, um, we heard in our class that David Howells was coming, and um, so that was really exciting. And um, so I was saying, "Oh, David's coming! This is so exciting!" And he would serve us tea every day. And say hello. And I thought he was just the help. <laughs> he would be washing the dishes all the time. And I thought, oh, this is so neat that David's coming in. Janet, who do you think's been serving us tea every day? <laughs> That's wonderful. Gosh, goodness gracious. Well, it was a very sad day when I left California. It was a very sad day uh, because I had so many think, things pulling me back. And what's so nice is that. With, with with Zoom, we can actually connect up again. Yes. You know, and that's really, really super that we can see each other and say hello and have a good laugh. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for that. Nancy. Yes? I want to know, when did you fall in love with David? Oh, Whoa. good information. <laughs> well, we started out as basically a, a teacher-student relationship. Yes. And I think it was over a number of years. I mean, it's not something that you can always pinpoint that's a certain day or a certain thing. Suddenly you realize that, that in a way you're, you're more than just a teacher-student relationship. And then you think, oh, goodness gracious, what am I getting into? Mm -hmm. Because he was 28 years my senior. And, you know, that's quite a lot of difference in age. I met him when I was 33 and he was 60. So you see, that's a huge gap. And, you know, my mother being Japanese would say things like, oh, why don't you meet a nice Japanese boy four to seven years older than yourself? <laughs> well, sometimes these things are not so easily done. <laughs> and uh, I think we just realized that we, we were kind of, uh, we worked together so well. And uh, we were in, in our own ways, uh, individuals, but we were very dedicated to each other. And I'll tell you a funny thing. We had planned our wedding and we were going to get married on, uh, in May. And he wrote to me and, and said, just a minute, 
I've got to go through customs. Uh, can you write me a letter to say, uh, you know, to make this official so I have some sort of document or paper to show the customs people? Because they always say, what's the intention or purpose of your visit? So I thought, how can he dare say that he doesn't know what he's coming for? I mean, how to, you know, what a coward. <laughs> so, so I wrote him this letter, it said, Dear Mr. House, such and such an address, Leicester, UK, England. Dear Mr. House, you have been selected to be the groom at the wedding of Nancy Ochita. <laughs> no, no, such and such a day on such and such a year. He will meet you at the airport, uh, flight number such and such, on such arriving on such and such a day. You will recognize her because she's wearing a white dress. <laughs> um, <laughs> he was so oh, romantic. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a truly did happen. I mean, I was... I thought this is this has got to be a joke. I mean, you know, so so I wrote this this outrageous letter. And he called up and said, "Yeah, I can't show this letter to anybody." I said, "Well, if you're going to get married, you should be brave enough to say you're going to get married." <laughs> oh, that's great! You remember when? Huh? You remember when Deanne Singh and Alice Mosley and Patty Day and I came over? Oh yes, for a senior school. The summer school. <laughs> so fun. Oh, that was so great. What a great we really one. got to know the English people during that period of time because we live with them. Mm -hmm. I know. I and and they seemed very shy at first, very uh oh my formal. God. so they not were, shy. <laughs> they they weren't at all. Actually, they're quite quite outward and brave. Oh I yes. Mean, the Americans are the ones who come out and say, hi, you know. But it's the it's the British who come up and say, um, "How do you do?" And until they get to know you, then when they invite you, they mean it. They they want you to show up for tea or coffee. I mean, they expect you to. An invitation is not lightly given in England. Yeah, that's that's a real difference between the the character and the social um, changes. Yes. Yes. We had a wonderful time. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. I'll tell you another secret about David and myself here. This is, this is you know, you're going to find out all about our life here. About, um, must have been about two months before we got married. He called me up and said, look, I, I think you should really think about this. I'm having second thoughts about it. And I think we should call the marriage off, the wedding off. And I said, oh, I said we've ordered everything, the, you know, the cake, the catering. The church is all set up and all this. And I thought, I mean, I just, I just broke into tears. I was just so upset that he would say something like this. And, and I was very surprised. And I, he says, you really must think about this because I'm 28 years older than you and I'll probably die before you do. And, you know, there's money and you're, I'm separating you from your friends and family, taking you back to England. And you, I want you to really think about this. We'll talk about it uh, at the end of the week. So we talked about it and he gave me another week. And I said, I, I said at the end of it, I still really would like to marry you. And he says, he says, I'm so glad you said that, but I wanted you to get, give you a chance to get out of it if it wasn't right for you. Oh, that's so sweet. And I thought to myself- I was thinking that was mean. <laughs> well, to I give you a heart good. attack like that. I know, I know. It, it seems it seems unbelievable that, but he he also just felt that he wanted to make sure that I knew what was happening, and that he was, you know, he didn't want to force me into anything that would be wrong and that might not work out. He he really cared about me enough to say, "I I'll, I'll let you go if you mm -hmm. want to." Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's really deep love, I think. Yeah. 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 Have you regretted it? No, I, I've had a great time. We, you know, I mean, every every relationship has has you know plus points and and some things that can be difficult, but we've really have had a wonderful relationship, and I'm so glad. And moving to England, I never thought I would move to England. I mean, you, you know, you don't think that these things are possible, but it's been a wonderful experience. Do you have any plans on coming back to the States for a visit? Oh, oh, I would love to come and to visit all the time. Yes. Um, 
you know, you just don't know what the future is going to hold at this present moment. You don't know if there's going to be another outbreak or what's going to happen or how safe it's going to be. So at this present moment, I'm just kind of holding safe. Yeah. And as it becomes clearer, then I think, you know, we can start traveling again. I mean, things are opening up pretty rapidly at this present moment, but you don't know what's going to happen. Um, well, you don't know what's going to happen anytime, actually. Yeah, it's true. Things are slightly, slightly more um, unstable than usual. Well, we're hoping to see you in Southern California next time you you decide to come travel. We'll uh, SFC will host, give you a give you a, a a nice welcome party. Oh, yeah. you're always great. You're always wonderful. You you I I'm I feel very lucky to have such such fine companions and colleagues in, in California and, and in Oregon. Well, and I you're mean, always yeah. welcome to Texas too. <laughs> oh, Texas, oh boy. You know, David and I went to the um, Cowboy Museum in uh, Oklahoma City because we taught a calligraphy in Oklahoma and it was really, David loved it. I mean, he just thought, he thought he, the, because they had John Wayne's horse there and his hat and everything. And, he, and, you know, they had a display of spurs and barbed wire and all this. David loves the cowboys with the hats and, uh, you know, like the Clint Eastwood walking in, you know, uh, you know, yeah, big thug, you know, make my day and all of this. <laughs> and he's, if he watched a cowboy show on television, he would draw the cowboy hats and the profile of their faces and things. He actually used it as a drawing lesson. <laughs> he also drew uh, Marlene Dietrich and Marilyn Monroe too, but that's another <laughs> story. <laughs> Nancy, well, Dennis you're always welcome at my house, you know, for a reception. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You have a lot of friends here, Nancy, and we'd love to see you. Well, I was there for about 28 years or something like that. So it was a, it was a long long stay because I came from uh, Oregon yeah. and uh, it was a, a you know a little bit um, I mean I didn't know anybody when I came to California then so it's been wonderful I mean the people are really warm-hearted and generous I mean we used to have buffets at our workshops that were like that, like Roman banquets I, mean, I know <laughs> I mean we used to sit there and say I remember one time we had like uh, 15 chocolate dishes and I thought 15 out of 20 chocolate dishes being chocolate. This is. <laughs> anyway, thank you for joining me and, and I wish you a safe, uh, a safe time and uh, stay well. And I hope to see you on the, my next trip. Definitely. I want to see you too. Yes, you're yeah. always welcome at my house to stay if you ever need a place. <laughs> the door will always be open to you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for staying after and nice just chatting with you. And Angie, thank you. You've been just wonderful sorting out this computer question. And thank you, Masato. Nice to see you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Take care. And I'll Take go to care, gallery everybody. view and see everyone all together. We can all wait. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Let's go to gallery Take view. Take your view to gallery view. <laughs> I, so I, Janet, Hi. Janet did her first watercolors with us. Do you remember that? You did a milk oh, yeah. bottle. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was wonderful. I mean, you, you've done so much since then. I mean, you've just grown and grown and perfected it. And you've been wonderful. Absolutely. And she's teaching wonderful. at Legacies, too. Yes. And, and, yes. <laughs> and Angie cool. is so good at, at the Zoom. I, uh, I think <laughs> you must she's work. So I bump into walls, but that's okay. <laughs> Open around. So thanks, everyone. I think, does anybody else have anything uh, to say to close out the meeting? You can speak now. Hi, Nancy. This is Ike. Hi, Ike. Hi, Ike. Hi, Ike. <laughs> Ike. Where are you now, Ike? I'm sitting right next to Louise. Oh, there you are. There you are. Yes. I see. Well, you're. I just there. I just see an edge of your face. Well, so, you see the whole yeah. thing now. I see the whole thing now. 
This is Louise and Ike from Washington, D.C., well, Maryland, actually, but they're, they're just wonderful people who come to our workshops and, and make the whole place become spirited and alive. And they treat the staff so well that the staff just can't wait for them to come back again. Take care. Thank you for, for spending some time with me this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Great fun. It was, hey, great. It was great. It was great being there with you. Nice to see you all again. Yeah. I've, you know, I've, San Diego sends love to you too, Nancy. Oh, gosh. We had a great time in San Diego. <laughs> we had a great time having you. That was a long time ago. It was. In the 80s. Oh, gosh, it was a long time. George Weinberg Harder. And yes, yes. Pat, Pat, um, Pat Miller. Pat Miller, that's right. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm Wendy Diedrich with a different name then, <laughs> last name. But I'll never forget uh, having you and David here and also receiving a beautiful Christmas card for you from you. Thank you. I want to see you when I visit England. <laughs> Well, give me a call and we'll see what we can arrange. I'd love it. <laughs> Good. Good. Nancy, Take care, everybody. You Thank you. Your little Thank car. You. Oh, no, no. I had to car. give it up. <laughs> the little car went, went all rusty. And, and oh. at the end of the day, it was so rusty that a man had came and said, look, sell that car as fast as you can because otherwise it's going to fall apart. And it was, it, the, the metal was flaking iron bits, iron like sawdust bits. And he said, don't lean on it or anything. And I, <laughs> and I sold it to a, um, a Citroen restorer. Oh. And he restored the car. He took the whole thing apart. Every nut, every panel, he took the whole thing apart. Uh, what do you say? de rusted it and then put it back together again. And he sold it. Not for a lot of money. He sold it. And it's still on the road from what I hear up north. <laughs> I mean, we had it and we had it. It was about 32 years old. <laughs> right. But David loved it because he could work on it. You see, because he, he was a, a, an engineer, a mechanical right. engineer. Right. And during the war, they couldn't get parts. So they had to make all the parts for the airplanes. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, this is not like Amazon where you order it and say, can you send it to me <laughs> next tomorrow? This, you know, they were, this was war. And, and uh, mm -hmm. the, when you think about it, they had to make all the parts. That's remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. So he was born mm -hmm. in 1919? 1918, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He lived right. to be 94 and a half. A gift to this world. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. He was incredibly creative. Yes, and one time um, I was, you know, you know how you, how you get things that you want to throw out. Well, he had a pair of old tennis shoes, and the soles had holes in it. And so I thought I can get rid of this. So I crept out to the dustbin and threw it away. <laughs> Next thing I see, I see him bringing the tennis shoes back again. It's under the bed. <laughs> And so I say, so I said, oh, look, you know, really, it's, it's time that these are, that are thrown out and we got holes on them and they're filthy and, you know, anyway, he says, you just hold it. One of these days, this will come in handy. And one day I got a flat on my bicycle tire and he took that old pair of tennis shoes and paired the sole and made a repair for my bicycle, glued it back on and repaired my bicycle tire. <laughs> and he said, we had to do that during the war. I mean, you know, they, they, had, they, didn't, have, they didn't have replacement parts. I mean, that's, and because of that experience, I think he was very um, resourceful when it came to his calligraphy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because people in the old days made everything. I mean, you know, you didn't go out to the shop and buy something. You just didn't, there was no shop to buy things with. Yeah. Well, anyway. Okay. So I, I want to, I don't mean to interrupt, but I guess I am interrupting. So um, we're going to end the meeting here. <laughs> we're going to end the meeting here. And uh, I think you're right. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much to everyone. And thank you very much, Nancy, for, for your talk.
So take care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks again, Nancy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Aloha. Lovely to bye. see you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. -bye.